What a blessed thought, that last line, Christ the Savior is born. You know, what an important thing it is to, to grasp that reality that the Savior was born because a Savior is needed. You know, the world is putting all its hopes in all kinds of things to help them or save them or prolong their life, be it vaccines, supposed experts in this or that or who knows. But the reality is everyone and for everyone it is appointed once to die. And after that, the judgment. And the only hope for all of mankind because of the realities of who we are as fallen in Adam and sinning in practice. The only hope is the forgiveness that is in Jesus Christ. He alone is Savior. So that's why the, the title of, of the sermon today is The Birth of the Savior. Not merely a Savior, but the Savior. And we'll consider that also in a moment. So let me read for you out of Luke. Before we began, it was read Luke chapter 1, verse 1 to 11, was read in the uh, opening of this service. So I will read from verse uh, 12 onward till verse 39, and then pray and we'll consider the entirety of that section. So look with me, if you would, in Luke chapter 2. Two, and I will begin in verse, well, I'm going to begin in verse 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and laying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. And when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph, and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given him by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Verse 22. And when the time came for their purif purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as is written in the law of Moses. Every male who first opened the womb shall be holy to the Lord and offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord a pair of turtle doves, and a young pig, two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the nations or Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is to be opposed. And a sword will pierce through your own soul also so that the thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, a daughter of Phenuel, of the tribe of Asher, 
And she was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping and fasting and prayer day, night and day. And coming up that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were uh, waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. Let's pray. Lord, as we just um, uh, take some time this morning to reflect on the, some of the rich elements of this remarkable section of Scripture, God, I pray that whenever we review such familiar things that you would be pleased to bring it to us with an, an astounding and remarkable freshness, with a power and a clarity. God, grant me to speak your word in a way that honors you, that gives you glory, that, that rightly and faithfully represents what you have given to us. Give your people ears to hear and hearts to worship, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now before we unpack this section, I do want to just draw our attention uh, to those few words that I had begun to read in verse 11. It had said this, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. That simple phrase is so remarkably meaty. And I'll just briefly unpack that before we kind of look at the overview of this chapter. Here he, he, they've come to them and they're telling him, the, 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 sh the shepherds, the angel is telling him them exactly where Jesus is being born, in the city of David. And we know that was promised and prophesied way back in the book of Micah that the Messiah would be born in that place. And again, I'm saying the word Messiah. The New Testament way of saying the word Messiah is Christ. Christ and Messiah are the same thing. And when you say Christ and Messiah, maybe that to us does not have the full import. For the children of Israel, he was the promised king who was to come. And even in the midst of their prophecies, they understood from books such as Zephaniah that uh, this priest would be, I mean, this one who would be the Messiah would be both an anointed priest and an anointed king. And the, the uniqueness of his person, so, you, so powerfully distinct. And what's, what's beautiful about this, it says this. I want you to note how personal this was. For unto you is born this day. I just love the simplicity of those words. It, not simply is born this day, but unto you is born this day. Letting those shepherds know this one who is born is to have extraordinary, unique, and necessary significance on your lives. It's not just general, it's not just random, it's not just a historical story. Unto you, for a powerful personal purpose, he was born. What a glorious thing that is to hear to the ears of a sinner who knows we have no standing before God unless he would in mercy forgive us. And then it also says that he was born this day in the city of David, a Savior. Now just by way of noting that for a moment, a Savior. The children of Israel had looked throughout their history and had many that they would refer to under that term Savior. But none with the significance of Christ. For example, many of the judges, if you read all the way back in the Old Testament book of Judges, they would come under attack. They would come under oppression. They would at times even be forced under, under exile by Philistine groups and other groups. And God would raise up from among them a deliverer. Same concept, same word. And that individual would be used of God in a military manner 
to deliver them from their particular oppression. Deliver them from the enemy that was engaging them and over them. But listen, all of those deliverers, all of those saviors were temporary. It was a temporary enslavement that they were a part of and it was a temporary redemption that, and deliverance that they were brought unto. But all of that pointed to a an, an more extraordinary slavery and that is that all men are by nature slaves of sin. All men are by nature, as the scripture warns us and reminds us, are under the power of the enemy. And thus, in need of a deliverer, in need of a savior. And in sending Jesus Christ, you had he who would be the great high priest. You had he who would be the one and perfect sacrifice. You had he who would be the eternal deliverer. He is the consummate Savior that none compare to. And when he saves, he saves to the uttermost. He saves completely. And he was born this day. There was a day that it actually happened. And it's always interesting to note, this is not like so many stories. Does not begin with the once upon a time notions, you know, that we all always hear. It doesn't begin with, with any uh, of the, those, you know, it came upon a midnight clear. No, this is the, the absolute factual reality upon which all of history and all of creation hinges. Not a small thing. And so when, now, so, you know, and then it says, I could almost just unpack this verse in our time here. Uh, a Savior who is Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the promised one. He's the awaited one. The totality of all he would accomplish, the Jews didn't even grasp it. They were looking for some kind of a political deliverer who would help them, but into that was sent one who would deliver their very souls from death to life. And then it says this, who is Christ the Lord, the Kurios. Again, noting it back to the term that was so oft used in the Old Testament, uh, that word Yahweh, or what we call Jehovah, that's translated Lord in the Old Testament. This is not just a man. This is God, very God, God's Son become man. So he, here is one who is God and man and who will take on the totality of man, be born as a man, who will ultimately live as a man, suffer as a man, and die as a man in perfect obedience. And in so doing, by the power of the eternal life within himself as the Son, bear the eternal wrath of God against my sin and yours, all who have come to him in faith. That's a remarkable thing. One that kind of breaks the boundaries of our comprehension. So, so let, let's look at, at, at the way this chapter unfolds, just to see a few pieces of it and worship our God this morning. Um, listen to what it says uh, in, in the very beginning of the chapter. It simply says this, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. And this was um, the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. Okay, so back off for just a moment. As a result of this decree, now people are going to have to make their way because the registration has to take place in their historic family town. So you've got to go back 
to where your lineage has its heritage. Now, a lot of us don't know that or don't have that. We live in uh, significantly migrant families, but you do remember, for the children of Israel, they generally had their tribes, and their tribes had their allotted areas, and within their allotted areas, they had their clans, and their clans often lived in particular cities and townships. Okay? And so listen, where had it been prophesied that the Messiah, the King of the Jews, would be born? In Bethlehem, Ephrathah. But now you have a problem, don't you? Because where does Mary, to whom the angel has come, and given the prophecy and the promise and the work of God, has then brought conception of the Christ child into the womb of Mary, where is she? She is in Nazareth of Galilee. Now, generally speaking, if you're, if you're with child, and as the time advances, because uh, you don't necessarily feel comfortable to travel. Now, you may, but again, our, the, their forms of travel were not near as comfortable as ours were. So generally, given the option, hey, you want to take a trip to Bethlehem or you just want to relax here until you give birth? It would seem most likely, let's just go ahead and give it a pause till we get through all this, then we'll figure it out. But, now note my facetiousness. In the power of God... What does he do? Now listen, could God not have, now remember, often anything that follows that phrase, could not God have anything that I might say, your answer is going to be yes, right? Because God is the almighty God in the fullest sense of that. So uh, could not God have simply sent Gabriel or another angel and said, Get ye hence to Bethlehem. Because, of course, angels spoke in the King James English. <laughs> no, they did not. But you, you get that sense, right? Could they not have done that? And would that not have been enough to get it done? Surely it would have. But in the wisdom of God, He did differently. And in his doing differently, it ought cause us to stand back and say, Oh my, what kind of God is this? To which the answer is, the only kind of God there is. The only God. So it's not even what kind of God. It's the, it's the God and how immense and how amazing He is. Because what happens? In order to bring it about, even so Joseph and Mary cannot be accused of trying to themselves accomplish the prophecies. It's likely they were even unaware Herod was unaware, many were broadly unaware, only the well-studied that Herod called together when the magi or wise men came could tell him. It wasn't general common language that that's where he was going to be born. But what happened? God so moved Caesar Augustus to make a decree that everyone is to be registered and must go to their own hometown. Now, many of you don't know who Caesar Augustus is, and I'm not going to go into extensive history, but most of you have heard of Julius Caesar. This is not him. All right. Uh, Julius Caesar is, is the one who, through his military endeavors, sort of brought about uh, the collective garnering of power in Rome and throughout the whole Mediterranean region. But even as he was gathering such power around him, you may know, trusted ones turned on him and he was killed. 
I'm sure all of you are aware of the stories. It's been made into movies and things. You have Mark Antony and you have Cleopatra and all, all, all these things. Well, this man, Caesar Augustus, was, to the best of our knowledge, his grandnephew who was adopted by him to take his place called Caesar because he had taken that surname and that surname came to represent the concept of emperor. Later it would carry on into other languages it developed and it would be the word Kaiser for those of a German background. And, and, and here, noting this, his name was neither Caesar nor Augustus. I mean, his name was like Octavian Tiberius, like, what happened then? Well, part of it is the whole idea of Augustus basically means venerated. Very, very important. Because under him, uh, once uh, Julius Caesar was killed, three different men reigned over different sections of the Roman Empire, and one by one, he consolidated so he was, as history notes, the first wholesale emperor of Rome. He was Caesar Augustus. He was emperor big man, to, to, to give a paraphrase to the notion. And actually it's because of him that we have the month of August. It was called by a different name prior to that. Nonetheless, um, what I want us to note is this. Uh, it's not a mere coincidence. Wow, isn't it great it worked out that it just so happened that this guy decided at this time, just in that brief nine-month period while she was pregnant, to demand these things. No coincidence. God was so moving to bring these things about. And, and I want us to understand this. We see Augustus Caesar, and it ends up being a demonstration of the Almighty Sovereign. Why do I say that? Because God is the one who put this notion in his mind. And this is there since the beginning. Just a few verses I'll read to you so that we get a sense of how great our God is. When he's sending Moses into Pharaoh. Now again, I can note for you, in those days, Pharaoh was the name of the big boy who ruled Egypt and often broader than that. Uh, other kings at different times. Caesar was that big name and big guy. God often was pleased to take the guy who say, seemed to be the big guy and show who was far bigger. All right. So, for example, with Pharaoh, it says this in Exodus 4, 21 and 22. The Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh the miracles that I have put in your power. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let my people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. So I always find that interesting. God says to Moses, look, go there, do this, show these miracles, and I'm going to make sure he won't listen to you. So why am I going? Because God told you to. But I don't think it'll be effective. Well, in your case, you don't need to think about it. It's not. He's not going to listen to you. And there's going to be hardening after hardening, refusal after refusal, until God moves them through the death of his firstborn to say, get out of here. And even then, his heart rehardened once again and he sought to chase them down. But it says this in Exodus 9, 16. Now listen, as God speaking to Pharaoh through Moses, he says this, but for this purpose I raised you up to show my power 
so that my name may be glorified in all the earth. Now, wait a second. So Pharaoh would be saying, thinking what? Either I am Pharaoh because I was born to the royal family as the firstborn and I deserve all the rights and privileges. And the reality is wrong. Nobody's just born. If anybody's born anywhere in any family, who brings about every single birth? Who is intimately involved and even by His power accomplishing every conception? God. Let's not lose sight of that. If people understood that, I think they'd change a lot of their actions that are going on. But listen, he might even have said no, depending on his scenario. I am in this position because I led a coup against the former fella. You know, with my skill and my wisdom, we overthrew, we overpowered, and now I'm the man by virtue of my greatness. And all of his reasons for why he is where he is are not complete. ultimate underlying reason for why he is where he is as Pharaoh of Egypt is God put him there. Wait a second. That sort of removes uh, he was more handsome than others. It removes he was more skillful than others. It removes, he, it removes all forms of pride, doesn't it? He was there for, and he wasn't there for ultimately himself. He wasn't there ultimately for Egypt. He wasn't there even ultimately to oppress Israel. He was there that God might make known his power, his glory, and his purpose in that moment. Pretty amazing, isn't it? And then it look, look with me, for example... Just a few more. Judges chapter 14, verse 4, speak of Samson and how suddenly his heart got wrapped up in a sweet young Philistine girl. And he goes to his parents and says, I want her, get her for me. And there I'm not even really paraphrasing. You can, you can read that. And it says this in Judges 14, 4, And his mother and father did not know that it was from the Lord, for he was seeking an opportunity against the Philistines. So listen, God is at work sometimes in ways we are aware of, and very often in ways we are not. And sometimes when something has worked out, we will oft work our way back and say, so wise was I in doing this, in deciding that, because this got us here. Thank you. Well, what happened? Because the reality is, we don't even know if maybe that momentary wise inclination was indeed the prompting to carry out the purposes of God. Now, before you start boasting and saying, ah, oh, yeah, God is secretly prompting me to carry out His purposes, uh, as He did wicked Pharaoh, as He did a, a, a multitude of other miserable men, Isaiah chapter 10, the wicked king of the Assyrians, and so on. So, again, a little humility here is good. Further, it tells us this in Joshua chapter 11. Joshua, verse 18, Joshua made war a long time with those kings. There was not a city that made peace with the people of Israel except for the Hivites and the people of Gibeon. They uh, took them all in battle. Listen to verse 20. Why did no other city, no, no other people other than the Hivites and the Gibeon, why did none of the others attempt to make peace with them? Verse 20 of Joshua 11. For it was the Lord's doing to harden their hearts that they should come against Israel in battle in order that they should be devoted to destruction and should receive no mercy but be destroyed just as the Lord commanded. Whoa. 
And so what I want you to understand is what's happening here with Caesar Augustus, that's not a new thing. And so that's why when we look forward and people think possibly the future of our nation and our livelihood is hinging on the things that take place in the next few months. Really? It is all in the hands of God. When God is pleased to tip, it totters. When God is, is pleased to uphold, it stands firm. But we, we know this. What is going to happen is whatever God pleases. Second Corinthians, or Second Chronicles, I'm going to just hit with a couple Chronicles because those who have been reading our, the McShane's readings have been reading these recently. If you have not done so, um, the new year is about to start and the McShane's reading schedule is sitting out on the literature table in the foyer for your own personal use. But listen, the Second Chronicles. It says this in Second Chronicles chapter uh, 10, verse 15 uh, concerning Rehoboam. It says, so the king did not listen to the people. They had told him, go a little easier. Your father was too hard on us. It was too much. The king did not listen to the people. Why? For it was a turn of affairs brought about by God that the Lord might fulfill his word, which was spoken by Ahijah. I was like, what? So, God at times will incline someone to go ahead and listen and do something when that suits his purposes. He will also incline someone to disregard advice when that suits his purposes. Wow! It seems like this God is so powerful, he has not only the pow power over influences that will attempt to be wielded, but even our supposed secret internal responses to those influences. Wow. Our God is big. And he says this even further. Um, look at Second Chronicles 22. Similarly, it says this, verse 7, But it was ordained by God that the downfall of Ahaziah should come about through his visit to Joram. So he went to go visit Joram, uh, who was recouping from an illness, because it was the design of God. So why was he suddenly so moved to visit this wounded king while he was recouping? It was the design of God because in going there, God was going to bring the man who would not only destroy the wounded king, but then would take him out as well. It was ordained by God. I mean, how important those words are. Even as we remember reading through Acts 13, and as many as God ordained to life believed in him. Such remarkable words the scripture uses that often uh, push beyond the parameters of my comprehension and, and just cause me to sit back and say, wow. What a God. Second Chronicles 25 says this, But Amaziah would not listen, hmm. for it was of God. Second Chronicles 25, 20. He would not listen, for it was of God, in order that he might give him into the hands of the enemies. My goodness, it seems left and right. Responses that individuals are doing whether they seem at times good or bad with widespread impact, we stand back and say, wow, the almighty sovereign. So when we say that, the almighty sovereign God, Caesar Augustus, you know? And by, by virtue of that, you might think, uh, Caesar Augustus, us. But... It, <laughs> But we're not worried about that guy because ultimately he is under the sovereign sway of one who is supreme and superior. Oh, what a great God. 
Now, I want us to see also in the midst of this, look at the amazing specifics that we see in this passage. Uh, he had consolidated and he became the emperor. Um, it, it also, this is, this is happening while Quirinius is uh, governor of Syria. So in the design of God, it, it, you have this, this appointment even of this, this individual who will go and he will be governor over Syria, which ends up being that whole um, uh, eastern Mediterranean section of land there and then he will serve Augustus Caesar in calling for a census for the purpose of taxation and the nice thing when you see names like this you realize this isn't like mythological characters you know you can look these people up in history and even beyond trustworthy history you can look them up in Wikipedia But listen, each to their own town. This town was about 80 miles away. But what an interesting thing. Why, why is uh, Mary, remember she has to have her child in Bethlehem. Did Caesar Augustus demand that everybody go to Bethlehem? No, everybody has to go to their own city. And you know what happens to be Joseph's city? And you know who happened to be betrothed to Mary? And I might ask you this, and do you know how it happened? Amazing, isn't it? So, it's so lined up that she was betrothed to a man of the house and lineage of David at a time that Quirinius was governor of Syria, appointed by Augustus Caesar for the purpose of registration. And so they would have to go to that specific city at that specific time because of a multitude of specific things. And note this, what city uh, uh, Joseph had to go to wasn't even his choice. He never chose what family and lineage he would be born into. And ultimately, it seems, given the choice, that's not where he would go. Now, why do I say that? Because to the best of our knowledge, all of his own, they were no longer there. Family, friends, you know, the people you go and you stay with, You know, we don't want to read too much into the silent sections of Scripture, but we do know this. When they went there, they did not stay with relatives. They did not visit his parents or his aunts or his uncles. Where did they go? They stayed ultimately in a stable because there was no room for them in an inn. Neither of those being the option generally if you have kin. And so we see uh, uh, just the remarkable, perfect timing in the way that God works all of this out. And I want you to also note this. Even in the sign that is going to be declared by the angels to the shepherds, what's it going to say? You're going to go and you're going to find him wrapped in swaddling clothes and laying in a manger. Now, why would a baby be laying in a manger? The, the, the equivalent of a stable feeding trough. Why would he not be in a proper bed or a proper crib? What is that? And so it, it's, it's quite interesting to see all of these details that work themselves out. And, and I guess for a moment, We just step back from all of that and say, look at the way that God is so working. They, uh, Jesus will be born into a humble family in extraordinarily humble circumstances. Remember, it it would have been very few ordinarily poor families who were giving birth in stables. Stable is not a code word for small clinic. All right. It's a place where animals stay. They had no other valid options. And so 
And, and shepherds at that time, look, you had a shepherd who might be the, uh, the chief shepherd and who might be the owner of the sheep, but the hired shepherds, listen, they were not generally considered among the elite of society, just to be aware of. The shepherds were, were, were sort, they were bottom rung uh, uh, among, among the people. And so he brings what? Seemingly the bottom rung into one of the lowest places, and that is the first introduction that takes place. So listen, if you ever feel like you're bottom rung, that's all right. <laughs> the bottom rung is blessedly welcome. And, what's, and then soon after that, we know the Magi will come, to which we develop songs, we three kings of Orientar, you know? Because they seem to be people of high standing, education, and some think some degree of nobility and notoriety. So wait a second. You have coming to see baby and infant Jesus from the bottom rung, seemingly, of society, and from the top rung, seemingly, of society, and when all of them see him, they are moved to glorify God and worship. What a great leveler, isn't it? Which I would remind you of simply this. By world standards, they still put different rungs. They still exalt, elite, important, lower this, and they still try to do so on the basis of, of careers and activities and education. Look, you know it's the only thing that matters in this life and in the life to come? Do you know Christ as your Savior? If you know Christ, then you are accepted in the Beloved. Indeed, you are adopted, listen, into what? The family of God. Jesus is then, in a sense, our elder brother. We are brothers to the King of Kings. So, are we really worried about all these different earthly standards? Nothing. It is only Christ that ultimately matters. What wonderful specifics. Look at the amazing declaration as we uh, will get to uh, move a little bit more quickly through the narrative here. So the shepherds are out in the fields uh, watching over the flocks by night. Um, and, it's, and an angel of the Lord appeared to them. The glory of the Lord shone round them and they were filled with great fear. It is night, it is dark. The angel appears and the glory of the Lord shones, which we understand to be like a response splendent radiance where suddenly where it was dark now you have almost like a, a bright light emanating from this individual who is now speaking with you that could invoke fear and it's and he said those words that we opened with in the sermon today fear he said fear not for i bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people what an important thing that is because for the longest time the Jews thought the Messiah was going to be only for them. Right? The consolation of Israel. Simeon will say later on in this chapter. The redemption of Jerusalem. Anna will say later in the, this chapter. Their, their mindset was, was very specific, ethnocentric and regionally located. But what is the angel already preparing for? The good news that will be for all people. Amen? Rich and poor, high and low, whatever, whatever the supposed skin color and hairstyle and national origin and language of choice, whatever it may be, he is the good news. He is the only source of what I might call true, great, abiding joy. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. All other happiness is fleeting and temporary. 
All other things are so weak and pale in comparison. Oh, a Savior, for unto us, he goes on to say, uh, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And listen to what it says in 1 John four fourteen. We have seen and testify that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. So listen, that's why we do missions. You know why? If they hear not of Christ... In this village in Africa, none will be saved because He alone is the Savior of the world. He is the only source of salvation in the remotest regions and villages, in the farthest coastlands, on the highest mountains, in the deepest valleys. There is no salvation in any other name given among men but in the name of Jesus. And so we understand that He sent Him to be the Savior of the world. And so do you know what we do? We declare it to the world. Now, regardless of if if that nation claims to be committed to a particular religion, there is no salvation in Islam. There is no salvation in Mormonism. There is no salvation in Judaism. There is only salvation in Jesus Christ. That's it. And that's why we go. And it's not to demean them and demoralize them and to merely disparage their culture and traditions. It's to declare to them the only hope of salvation and forgiveness that is Christ We go not to condemn. We go that we might declare for them the only hope to be delivered from condemnation. And that is Christ. And so we go and we declare the Savior of the world. And this will be the sign. You will find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and laying in a manger. Now, what are the odds that there won't be 20 babies laying in a manger in Bethlehem. (laughs) Pretty high. You could probably go across almost all of Judea and Samaria and not find a baby lying in a manger because it's just not what you generally do. You know, it's not, some might say in modern methodology, not the most hygienic situation, right? And then, I, then they, they respond with a song. And the song is remarkable. We call it a song because it says the heavenly hosts were praising God and sang. And often praise is, is a term that expresses what gives in song. Glory to God in the highest. And the, the ESV says, and on earth peace, and on earth among those, peace among those with whom he is pleased. Now that's a little bit scary. <laughs> It, when it says this, and among, on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. And then I might think of my life. Hmm. With all that I say and all that I do and all that I think, would he be pleased with me? Oh no! <laughs> That's a, a, a particularly frightening notion. Uh, because of the strength of that notion, to some extent, the King James fellas uh, uh, broadened it and simplified it that it made everybody feel good and makes for wonderful greeting cards. They simply said, goodwill towards men. Well, not an uh, interesting notion. As the Magi come and say, where is he who was born King of the Jews? How did Herod respond to that? He was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. They weren't considering it a goodwill. In a sense, because of Herod, what would soon happen to all of the young boys in Bethlehem? They would end up being slaughtered by Herod. Would any of those families consider that a good and peaceable situation? You know, What about the Pharisees who are to come? So the, the, the idea of a blanket peace and goodwill towards men. No, this is, is not. Jesus said, do not think that I have come to bring peace. 
But I've come to bring a sword. From now on, a household will be divided against itself. Often, those who are reading through the Gospel of John, as we are right now in the McShane's reading, uh, uh, for the second time this year, it it, it says this, often in there, it, it says this, and they were divided concerning Jesus over this. And there was a division over Jesus because he said. And it's over and over again. You look at, look at that and think, well, that's not peace and goodwill. You know, the whole, he is filled with Beelzebub, not goodwill. The whole, let us lay hold of him and kill him, not goodwill. The whole process of crucifixion. Far from goodwill. But I want you to note this. So again, a few more translations. The Holman Christian Standard says it this way. Peace on earth to the people he favors. Hmm. The NIV says this. On earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. Hmm, It's a little bit more peculiar and particular. Uh, as challenging as the notion is, the textual commentary on the Greek New Testament on page 111 says this. The meaning seems to be not that divine peace can be bestowed only where human goodwill is always already present, but that at the birth of the Savior, God's peace rests on those whom he has chosen in accord with his good pleasure. Now let us go from a declaration to a discovery. The discovery is simply this, they went to see. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, laying in a manger. What did they go and find? A baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, laying in a manger. Now, not like some crazy traditions had, he, unlike the angel in the wilderness who was glowing in the dark, baby Jesus was not glowing in the dark. Okay, we even sang a song that uh, that artistically radiant beams from heavenly light. You know, is it, saying it's what, and and you see paintings to this effect, and sometimes it gets even weirder where where they claim to have uh, uh, Jesus in his infancy able to absolutely sit up and communicate with those who come and meet him. That's, yeah, it's somewhat hilarious. But I think part of these confused traditions are the amazement of the mystery, God become man. You know, and, 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 and it leaves us somewhat flabbergasted. But look, he grew in wisdom and knowledge, it will tell us in the next chapter. So in the design of God, Christ would even develop incrementally in the same practical experiences that we have. So it wouldn't be a talking baby. It wouldn't be a shining baby. It was a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes laying in a manger, which seems unmiraculous. And maybe even to to them, you go there, it's not a scene that invokes awe. You know, there's a, there's a particular uh, scent that would be associated with stables. You know, there, there, there's a, 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 it's not going to have the same kind of internal lighting that other places would have. It, it's just a different, different situation. So sweetly humble. We also see they, they went to see what the Lord had made known to them. As soon as they saw it, what did they do? Words of witness. Listen to what it says, verse 17. When they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning the child. What's the saying? A Savior, Christ, the Lord. This is God. This is the Deliverer. This is the Promised Anointed One. This is Him. Wow. And I like that they made known what was said about Him. And it, sa- and it says this, uh, uh, they made it known... Uh, the saying that had been told them concerning this child, and all who heard it wondered at what had been said. Now listen, what did they see? A baby in a manger. That's, that's not the most uh, 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 life-transforming vision, right? 
Listen, at that point, Jesus had not yet lived a sinless life in his incarnation. He'd not yet gone to the cross in his perfect holiness and borne our sin, dying on our behalf, and then rising from the dead. All right, so what we now know of him is so much more than what they heard. And yet, what did they do? They told everybody. <laughs> Why? Because they believed what the angels told him, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. How is it that we don't tell this to everyone? Oh, that everyone would hear this. Words of wonder, and it says, all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told him. There's a marveling, there's an amazement, because it's not ordinary. It's different. Mary treasured these things up, pondering them in her heart. 2 verse 33 says, The father and mother marveled at what was said about him. 2 verse 38 says, Coming at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God, speaking of him, this is Anna, speaking of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. So what did Simeon do when he came to the temple? He spoke of him to everyone who was around. What did Anna do? She spoke of him to everyone who was around. What did the shepherds do? They spoke of him. What do we do? We speak of him. How could we not? How could we not? And then lastly, we see a devotedness. And I'll just uh, summarize the simplicity of these things. Uh, we see Joseph and Mary. What was required when a child was born to, within the Jewish system is on the eighth day the child would be circumcised. And then what would happen is, if having given birth to a male child, uh, the woman would be unclean for seven days, and then on the eighth day, she would, to some sense, be clean. Then she would have to go through a purifying period of time that was 33 days. And at the end of 33 days, then they would go to the temple in Jerusalem and they would offer a purifying sacrifice. And if you look at the section I've noted in your notes, if you didn't get a worship folder, get one on the way out. In Leviticus, it indicates that if you cannot afford a lamb, then bring uh, uh, two doves and two pigeons. And what did Mary bring? Two doves. And two pigeons, indicating what they were from such a humble and simple background. But with their humil humble and simple circumstances, they did what the law required of, of Christ on the eighth day. They did what the law required of them. They continued, and it says a few times in this chapter, as it says in the law of Moses, as it says, and they strove to do that to a certain extent, but everyone fails to some degree. And whoever fails in one point, James says, is guilty of all. But listen, the child that was circumcised on the eighth day and the child they took with him then on the, uh, on the 40th or so day, the child they took with him then when he was 12 years old, he never disobeyed the law. So we see that wonderful obedience uh, that they performed everything according to the law, Luke 2.39. We see Simeon also come in and it says of him that he was devout and waiting. And what a remarkable thing. God had told Simeon, you're not dying until you see the Messiah. Wow. That's a remarkable thing. And isn't it amazing that it just so happened on the day that they, brought, they came to the temple for the purification and the presentation of Jesus, it just so happened that Simeon showed up that day. Is it? No, what does it say? Verse 27, And he came in the Spirit into the temple. He brought him there. And, I'll, and don't miss this. I love the words that it says here in verse 29. No, verse 30 says this, For my eyes have seen your salvation. I mean, that is, a, that is a powerful phrase. I wonder to what extent Simeon understood all that that meant. 
That it was a salvation from sin for all time. No judgment, but someday we will stand before God, accepted in Christ. He will wipe every tear from our eye and we will dwell with the Lord forever. And at His right hand there are pleasures forevermore. I don't know if he grasped all of that. But I also wanted to, don't want us to miss this. He's looking at a baby. He's looking at Jesus and he says... I have seen your salvation. Jesus is the salvation wrought of God. Then he says, of course, this in verse 34, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel. People are going to be for or against. Christ is ultimately the dividing line of all humanity for all eternity. (laughs) That's it. And it says, a sign to be opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. When we, by grace, come to salvation, we are as cut to the heart, pierced to the heart. That's what happened on the day of Pentecost when Peter preached. They were cut to the heart to the heart and they believed in Jesus and I love the fact that he says to Mary and a sword will pierce your own soul also you know who also needed a savior Mary Joseph you know as much as the Israelites might like to think highly you know who else needed a savior Moses Abraham you know who needs a savior Everyone who will ever be saved. You know the only one who did not need a Savior? He who was and is the Savior, Jesus Christ. And lastly, we love the words of, uh, of Anna. It says, she, at verse 37, she gave thanks to God and to speak of Him to all who were waiting. So I just want to note those two things uh, in it. What do we do? Oh, we witness and we worship. So we don't only tell of Him to others, we glory in Him ourselves. I tell you what, those who don't glory in Him themselves but simply tell of Him to others, people will see that. (laughs) They'll see fake, fraudulent, hypocrite. They will see it. It, he, you know, you tell them you need to turn to him, you need to follow him, and, and if, you, if your life and character is no different, what's it going to mean? What's it, what are they going to see? And I love the, the way that this unfolds. They worshipped, they witnessed. They worshipped, they witnessed, and, and in a sense, throwing another word, they wondered, they marveled. They were amazed. And when I look, think of this today, I think of all of the sovereign hand of God in this, it, it, it just amazes me and leads me to marvel and wonder. When I contemplate what was sent and accomplished in Jesus Christ, the Savior, I worship. And oh God, help me and you to witness. Let's pray. Lord, we are so thankful that we could spend this time in your word. And oh, what a glorious season it is. How significant, how important, how enduring. Lord, we thank you that here uh, as your people, we don't only think of this annually, but this is what gives us life and hope and strength every single day. Lord, we thank you that it is not merely Christmas that is the day that the Lord has made but you have made them all. And we want to be a people who rejoice, who look to you with gladness and hope because of the salvation that is ours in Christ. Lord, we pray that when we contemplate your word and and the rich scope of it, it oft uh, goes beyond our full comprehension, but we desire to embrace it with wonder. We desire to fall before you in worship. We desire that you might open our mouths to witness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.